Now we turn to David Korshane from the Nishinaabe people. The original people, any title search, any title search done in North America will get to an empty place, but then it will go back to the native people who were originally here. And so we're honored that you joined us, David. Thank you. Your turn. Thank you. Bonjour, Anin. Migani Akini Nivish Nikas Kinyun Dutim, Kibab Jituana in Ejigi Tutme, Mamsh, Mimtigo Jimmy Wetchmanagaina, Katabendang Mayaip Majis, Niwe Jimanik. My dear brothers and sisters, it is truly an honor to be in the presence of, of my fellow human beings, and especially to those that act in the capacity of leadership that try to help all of us to realize that there does need to be some great changes that have to be made if we are going to survive as the human race. We have arrived at a time of great opportunity, an opportunity to change and to move beyond this world that has kept us separated, kept us violent, and all those many other ideologies or concepts that, that continue to, to destroy life the way we see what we are doing to the earth. In the prophecies of our people, it has been told to us that we have arrived in a very special time. And that is why I see it as a great opportunity as the human family. That we are arriving at a time where the earth is about to give birth to a new life. We have been waiting for this opportunity for a long time as the original people of this land. And we were told that there would be the arrival of new people on our land, that they would bring the uniqueness that is represented in the human family. And then we were to, as the, as the original people of this land, help fulfill the prophecy of our visionaries and prophets, that it would be here in America that the truth would be revealed. And I want to begin that revealing of the truth by saying that, first of all, that we do not own the land, that we owe our existence to the land itself. Mm -hmm. And nature is revealing to, to all of us that she is truly a living entity with great intelligence. She reflects woman, grandmother, mother, and she is the true voice of love and kindness and all that reflects the best of our humanity, the best of who we are as human beings. Unfortunately, the women have not been allowed to express the truth of the gift that they carry, which is the voice of the sacredness of life. And we as men, we will never be men until we are initiated by women. And I say this in all sincerity and all belief, because these are the teachings that has helped my people to survive and to keep a close and sacred connection to, to the earth itself. Our people have always referred to the earth as Mother Earth, which makes us all part of the connection that is needed for us to understand that we are all truly children of the earth. And we have to come to terms with the way that we are behaving and the only way that we are going to move beyond this nightmare that we're living in is to make a return to the, to the mother, to seek the guidance and the direction that we need to help all of us to understand our true purpose and meaning in this life. In our belief system as indigenous people, we've always believed in the higher power of spirit, the one we refer to as our great creator, the great mystery. It is through the blessing of this great power of unconditional love of spirit that we come here and we enjoy the blessing of living this human life. It has always been in our belief system that through the great love of our great creator, he created this home for all of us that we call Mother Earth. It is and should be a paradise for us. But look at what we have done to the earth and how we treat each other as the human family that only a few people enjoy the richness and the abundance that belongs to all. These are the things that need to be changed. And you know who's going to change it? It's going to be Mother Hurt herself. She is going to reveal, and she is revealing it now as the rebirth of the new life comes upon us. And then she's going to show us 
and she's going to use her own force of nature to reveal to reveal the love that she has for life and it it the extent of the force that she will she will use will be determined by our willingness or unwillingness to change or the willingness to say well you know i want to fulfill my purpose in this life as a human being and really it's very simple to help bring the manifestation of the the fulfillment of the dream of our great creator and that is to bring love and peace into this world can we find it within ourselves to act as the instrument of the will of the spirit that is there to offer us the guidance and the direction and the strength that is needed you know to help bring peace and love into this world it is told to us by the vision visionaries of our people that it is time now to put our children back into the center of our lives and they were born with the right to be told the truth and the truth is beginning with them knowing that we owe our existence to the earth itself that all life that is generated from the earth is there and meant for all of us to enjoy life every child is born with rights and that we are not protecting those rights of the children because we are denying children that is right the right of good clean water we are denying our children with the proper care that is needed in order to find fulfillment in their own life we have not done well as the human family we pride ourselves and in our intelligence and the technologies that we have created but unfortunately these these technologies have done nothing less but destroy life and destroy the earth not only have we called or per perpetrated war against ourselves as human beings we have we have done war to the earth itself as these weapons that we have created and we bomb we bomb people for for whatever reason but we can't see the extent of the bombing that is happening we are we are we are at war with the earth when that bomb hits it hits mother earth and we can't see it we can't feel it because we do not have a simple understanding of that connection and that sacred connection that we should have with the earth nature is what we've always depended on to be the book that we would depend on as a people that would guide us and teach us because the the, the book of nature is the book of life and if we really truly love our children then join us as indigenous people as the first people and let us take the children back to the land so that they can feel the essence of the love that they need in their life let us do it together let us ask from spirit that power that we need the power of courage and the power of love that will be required for us to bring our children back into the center of our lives with the grandmothers and the mothers being the ones voicing the voice of truth the voice of love and compassion that i remember that i will never forget that i've received from my own mother and my grandmother that reminded me constantly to be kind and to put the spirit of kindness within my own being that is what the children need to hear that is what the children need to be inspired to do i really uh, am so honored to be in the presence of so many gifted people and i always remember when i fasted in the mountains and the spirit said to me go now now go and be with the gifted ones and i never understood really what that meant but i do today <laughs> the gifted ones are the people of the heart and i know you're out there thank you for coming thank you If you allow me to step out of my moderating role for one second, you remind me so much of the Buddha when he was uh, at the brink of enlightenment. The devil spoke to him and said, "Who asked you to be Buddha? What is this? You know, who needs enlightenment? And why are you claiming to be Buddha?" And he said, "He said, uh, well, there was some more exchange, which I'll just long story short. He touched the Mother Earth with his right hand. If you ever notice the statue of Buddha, he's touching Mother Earth, and there he was calling Mother Earth to witness." that she needs the men to come and step to buddhahood meaning enlightenment not himself personally but anyone who opens their mind to enlightenment what they do is they touch the earth 
And once they touch the earth, they then begin to face reality and deal with it. And so you remind me so much of that. And thank you so much you. from the wisdom of the Nishinaabe people for coming to us. All right. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to respond to before we move on to the next speaker? Actually, we're going very good. For once, we're, way, we're going well in time. I don't have to worry. <laughs> Anybody else want to say anything with, uh, with um, David Koshen from the Nishinaabe? Or shall we go on? I just want to thank you. I don't know how to say it. I just think it's awful that we still in our history can't acknowledge the, that this country was built on genocide. And, That's uh, right. That's true. And we do acknowledge. We acknowledge. We do. We acknowledge. Officially, we, uh, no. if officially, you know, we know that we've reached a stage in our democracy where official doesn't necessarily represent the people's will. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and also that part of our country uh, was taken from Mexico. Yeah. You know, 50% of, of Mexico was stolen around the excuse of the Alamo. So, uh, you know, just little me, I, I'm really sorry we ripped off your land. <laughs> me too. Well, the Canadians are a little better in that they acknowledge what they call first Americans. And we'll catch up. Never say never. Okay? <laughs> even the men in suits will someday either take them off or they'll behave well even in the suits. I shan't hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, good. Now I get the Dalai Lama kisses. That's lucky. Thank you. Now, Wade Davis. Wade Davis, thank you for coming. It is your turn now. Well, I think um, I'll follow up on partly what David said, what Marianne said, and what Jody said um, through the anthropological lens. You know, over the last 20 years, geneticists have finally proven it to be true, something that philosophers have always dreamt to be true. And that is a fact that we all really are brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, quite literally, we are cut from the same genetic cloth. Studies of the Y chromosome and the male descent line and mitochondrial DNA in the female lineage leave no doubt whatsoever that the human genetic endowment is a single continuum. Race has been exposed as an utter and total fiction. All of us, in fact, are descended from a relatively small handful of people who walked out of Africa some 65,000 years ago and embarked on this extraordinary hegira of 40,000 years, 2,500 human generations, in which we sowed the planet in every habitable zone with the human imagination. But if you accept that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, you have to embrace the corollary. And that is the fact that every human population shares the same raw human genius, the same mental acuity. And whether that genius is invested in technological wizardry which has been the great achievement of the West, or by contrast, placed into the unraveling of the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no progression in the affairs of culture. There is no ladder to success. That old Victorian idea that there was sort of a pyramid upon which the apex sat Victorian England as it sloped down to the so-called primitives of the world has been exposed as as much a 19th century conceit as the idea of clergymen in the century that the earth was only 6,000 years old. The brilliance of science has reaffirmed the essential connectivity of humanity. And what this means is that the myriad of cultures of the world are not failed attempts at being you. They're unique answers to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when they answer that question, they do so in 7,000 different voices. And those voices collectively become the human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that we as a species will embrace over the ensuing millennia. Now, that revelation puts into kind of stark profile one of the most dark statistics of our era. And that is the fact that of the 7,000 languages spoken the day that each of you were born, today fully half aren't uh, being taught to children. Every two weeks, somewhere in the world, an elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. What this means is that in a single generation, we are literally losing half of the intellectual, social, and, and spiritual legacy of humanity. And this does not have to happen. 
You know, we in the dominant society have this conceit that, you know, while we've been indulging technological innovation, somehow the other peoples of the world have been intellectually idle. Nothing could be further from the truth. We also have this idea that these, col these cultures, you know, quaint and colorful as they may be, are somehow destined to fade away as if their failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at being us. Nothing could be further from the truth. In every case, these are dynamic, living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. Yes, maybe we don't embrace genocide, but we do embrace ethnocide, the destruction of a people's way of life. Now, these forces can be egregious industri industrial policies. They can be uh, ideological triumph of the Marxist materialists of Beijing over the spiritual essence of Tibet. They can be ill-conceived modern development schemes. They can be the very cult of modernity that we present not as what it is, which is simply the expression of a certain form of organizing economic and social behavior that came out of a particular lineage. We treat it in our own cultural myopia and in our, our own fiercely loyal identity to ourselves as somehow this force outside of nature, this inexorable force that cannot be resisted and that you must somehow get onto the train of it or you'll be left behind. And that is wrong, because modernity as we know it is just the product of a set of ideas. And those ideas, as Marianne suggested, came out of a specific place. We wanted to free ourselves from the tyranny of the medieval church. We wanted to celebrate the individual at the expense of the collective, not knowing that that would be the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom. When Descartes said all that mattered was mind and matter, in a single gesture he devitalized the universe. Saul Bellows said that science has made a house cleaning of belief. So the, the idea that the earth could have anima, that the flight of a hornbill could have meaning, is, is, is dismissed as, and ridiculed, dismissed as ridiculous. And yet that's the es essential idea that inspires the vast majority of peoples in the world. Indigenous people are not weakened by nostalgia, nor are they sentimental. There's not a lot of room for either idea or feeling in the harsh winds of the Arctic or in the high mountains of Tibet but they have nevertheless through time and ritual forged a, a kind of a mystique of the earth that's based not on the idea of them being closer to it than we can be, but on a far subtler intuition. And that's the idea that the earth only exists because it is breathed into being by the human imagination. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of that is profound. I grew up in Canada to believe that the forests of British Columbia existed to be cut. That made me very different than my friends amongst the Quahil, who believed that those same forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven and the cannibal spirits that dwelt at the north end of the world that would have to be embraced during the Hamut's initiations, wisdom, the wild, could get back to the community and the potlatch. Now, the issue isn't who's right and who's wrong. The interesting thing is how the belief system mediates the relationship between the human population and the environment with profoundly different ecological consequences. We can only do what we do to the earth because we do not believe it's alive. Think of the elder brothers who came to us the other day. Those, those men in those funny white outfits literally believe their prayers maintain the cosmic balance. To become a mamo, you have to go into the darkness for 18 years. Two nine-year periods that deliberately mimic the nine months of gestation in your natural mother's womb, now you're in the womb of the great mother. And for that entire time, the world only exists as an abstraction as you're enculturated in the values of your society, which maintain the proposition that your prayers and rituals alone maintain the cosmic balance. At the end of that 18-year period in which the young man has literally never seen a natural landscape, he has taken out on pilgrimage to the heart of the world. And the priest who has trained him says, you see, I've been telling you all these years, it's that beautiful. It's yours to protect. That is the essential difference between ourselves and the indigenous people. What does it take in Canada to get a mining project established? I'm fighting one off right now in the sacred headwaters. All you have to do is get together in Toronto with a bunch of other men from the golf course, cobble together a company with less history than my dog, get online to secure the subsurface rights to a place you've never been, the stories of which you've never heard, the pain of a ha harsh winter you've never felt, nor the promise of a bright spring. And as long as you can guarantee the government a flow of revenue, either in the form of taxation or royalties, you by definition secure the right to transform that place forever. There's not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the industrialization of the wild that places any value on the land left alone or any cost to the collective, the commons, the rest of us, implicit in its destruction. We take that as a given, but in the, across the realm of cultures of the world, it is highly anomalous behavior. 
Why do you think it was that the Aboriginal people of Australia never, quote unquote, improved upon their lot? Not because the British, as the British thought they were stupid and therefore they shot them, it's because they had a whole different devotional philosophy, which was the dreaming. The dreaming wasn't a dream. The dream was a state of perpetual multidimensional reality that existed at all places at all time. You went on the song line, which was a trajectory walk to the dawn of time when the rainbow serpent and the ancestors sang the world into existence. The entire purpose of life was stasis, constancy. They had no interest in a cult of improvement. Their entire ideology was based on a devotional culture of stasis. It's as if all of our Western intellectual tradition had been focused on maintaining the Garden of Eden carefully pruned exactly as it was at the time of the first dawning. In not one of the 670 languages and dialects of Australia was the word for time. There was not a word for past, present, or future. There was just the eternal moment in which the world existed but was constantly being born through the realm of the dreaming. So how do you create a cult of progress in a world that hasn't taken shape yet? It's like trying to get your embryo into Harvard. Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> but the consequence was profound. Now had humanity followed that intellectual devotion, yes, we wouldn't put a man on the moon, but we wouldn't be talking about climate change either. So these cultures don't represent sort of quaint aspects of our past. They represent visions in which we can embrace values inherited from them as we move into a new future. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Originally, when, <coughs> when His Holiness, when we had thought His Holiness would be with us, we had planned for the Mamo, the Kogui and Arawako and Wiwa people, their Mamos, those men who had men, but who had been in the dark for 18 years, who were behaving themselves, therefore. I, I'd like to say one more quick thing of acknowledgement <laughs> to Bob, because uh, you me. have to understand. Uh, <laughs> For the Kogi and the Wiwa and the Arawakos, nothing is separate from significance. So for them to come up here was an extraordinary thing where they went through divinations for months. And they brought uh, one of their metaphors, of course, is the empowerment of objects from the sacred snows to the ocean and back to the snows and so on. So they came up with a bundle of stones for His Holiness. But they weren't just stones. These were stones in which these men had stayed up for nine days in a row uh, without sleep and without food, placing the power of their imaginations mm -hmm. in these stones. So the fact that Bob managed to allow that transmission to happen and the photographs taken with His Holiness, we will put on the front page of every newspaper in Columbia, I promise you. <laughs> and this will do hugely important things for their political struggle. So I'm I hope really so. grateful. Well, they, 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 they felt that uh, these stones needed to be taken to Tibet by His Holiness. And His Holiness can't go to Tibet. Uh, he, he had me inform them, but when he, when he's, he will keep them in a place of prayer in his shrine until he does. So they are, they are stones. Some of them originally came from Tibet, the, those stones. And somehow they came into the possession of the Kogui, Mamo, Arawako, and the other tribe, and uh, the other nation. And they, and they now will return because they feel when these, these sort of magical and powerful objects are placed back where they, the earth will retain a kind of balance. That is their view. And who's to say? Who knows? Who's to say? It's wonderful. And just as a footnote, uh, uh, Jody informed me of the fact that I, which I agree with, that men have been in the dark since time immemorial. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us, we just don't know we're there. <laughs>